Um, so, hi, thank you. I should say, we're not the only nonprofit dealing with intersex issues. We are the only nonprofit in the country dealing with intersex and law. Um, just to specify, there are a number of community organizations doing really great work out there. Um, and when I started this project, dealing with intersex issues in law, I really didn't expect to be working at all in the immigration asylum context. I know very little about immigration law. Um, it, we're a domestic legal organization, um, and I just didn't expect it. But we are also the only organization that does anything with intersex in law. And so when intersex people who were asylees or refugees um, came to people all over the country, they came to us for information. Um, and so I'm beginning to develop some expertise. I didn't expect to be dealing with these cases, but I am. Um, and one of the things I want to point out to start with is that there's no even map of human rights abuses against intersex people. It's really varied. It's really spread out around the world. It really depends on a person's individual circumstances. So some of the stories that I hear from people um, in the asylum and refugee context are also stories that I hear domestically when we're talking about intersex children. Um, so for example, in this country, we're dealing with issues of unethical human medical experimentation. Um, we're dealing with issues of non-consensual surgery. Uh, we're dealing with surgical techniques that look like what America calls female genital mutilation when it's done in other countries. When it's done in this country to intersex children of very similar techniques, it's just called surgery. Um, I'm, find intersex. I'm, gonna get, I'm getting there. <laughs> I will define intersex before I go far. Um, so I'm going to do that, and then I'm just going to tell some stories about some of the situations I've encountered, because it, it's hard to present a coherent picture. It is really individualistic. But I'll try to give you, give you guys some idea of what kinds of things we're seeing out there in this context. Um, but so to start with, what is intersex? I know everybody doesn't know that term. Um, and this is this part of the lecture I give all the time to doctors and medical students, as well as attorneys. And I call it, everything you learned in sex ed was wrong. Um, a better way of saying that actually might be just take everything you learned in sex ed and put the word usually in front of it. Because much of what we all learned is not universal. It's what's common. Um, so what do we learn? Well, we all learned, first of all, in sex ed that there are two kinds of people. There are people that go in the pink box and people that go in the blue box. Uh, those two boxes are totally different. They're totally separate. There's no overlap. Um, in fact, we sometimes talk about them as containing two different planets. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? We talk about them as different species sometimes. We're that different. Um, and we also learned that some certain physical characteristics go along with these two boxes. So in one box, um, we have people with XY chromosomes, and in the other box, we have people with XX chromosomes, um, and so on. There are many other physical characteristics <laughs> Two boxes. And so if you have a person that has these physical characteristics, uh, ovaries, a clitoris, labia, vagina, then you know it's a girl. And if you have a person with these characteristics, then you know you've got a boy. Um, well, usually. Usually that's true. Um, and with this comes a whole package of other things most of us also learn. Uh, if you're in the boy box, you get a male gender identity, you grow up to be a man, and you're attracted to women. And if you're in the female box, you get a female gender identity, you grow up to be a woman, and you're attracted to men. Um, now, usually, right? <laughs> what, we're, what we're learning, what we learned in San Francisco, what the rest of the country and the rest of the world is beginning to learn, is that these things below the gender announcement, what they say in the delivery room, that these things can be mixed and matched in various ways. That a person who has a typically male body might not have a male gender identity. That a person who has a male gender identity might not be attracted to women, and so on. Um, and the biological pieces um, don't always follow the typical patterns either. And so that's what I'm talking about. When I talk about intersex, I'm talking about these things above the line. And I'm saying that just like our aspects of behavior can vary and don't just fall into two camps. The physical characteristics also don't fall clearly into two camps. Um, so not everybody has XY or XX chromosomes. Um, 
there are a number of other variations that are possible. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, there's a reason why I have these characteristics sort of paired up the way that I do. Um, when a fetus is developing in the womb, there, first of all, when they start, there's no sex differentiation, right? We all start as a little ball of cells. You can't look at the little ball of cells and tell when one's a boy and one's a girl. Um, and then those balls of cells grow and differentiate and grow different body parts. Uh, a nose appears, ears grow, genitals grow. Um, and the genitals, the male and female genitals, develop from the same set of tissue in an embryo. So the same tissue either grows to be testes or it grows to be ovaries in response to hormonal signals in the developing fetus. Um, or they grow to be sometimes ovotestes that have tissue from both, from both um, kinds of organs. Or sometimes they don't differentiate. They're called what's called street gonads that aren't clearly testes or ovaries. Um, sometimes a person will have one of each. Similarly, uh, the tissue that either grows to be a penis or grows to be a clitoris uh, grows in response to hormonal signals. So, um, you know, this is often one of the things we talk about when we talk about intersex. One of the things that's really hard for people to imagine is how can you not tell a boy from a girl? It's all so obvious. It's all so easy. Um, but actually, when you think about it, we have these, we have these parts that are analogous and that are really um, developed, when they develop typically in, in the uterus, are easy to tell the difference. But when they develop atypically, sometimes aren't. So you have this tissue that if it gets a lot of androgens in utero, it's going to grow and look like a penis. And if it doesn't get a lot of androgens in utero, it's going to stay small and look like a clitoris. Or sometimes you get something in between. Sometimes you get something that some doctors might call a micro penis. Sometimes you get something that um, doctors might call a mega, mega clitoris or a clitoromegaly. Um, and those two terms can be applied to the same body part, depending on what doctor is talking about it. Uh, the same tissue either grows to be a scrotum or it grows to be labia. Um, or sometimes it's a scrotum that doesn't com completely close up and there's a division there that can look like a vagina. Or sometimes it's what doctors call scrotalized labia, where the labia are very enlarged and it can almost look like a scrotum. Um, so these are all the different ways that things can develop. These last two sets of internal organs actually grow from different kinds of tissue, but um, all fetuses originally have the potential to have either set. And again, in response to hormonal signals, one and the other will develop. Um, so what I'm saying is all of these things above the line can also mix and match in various ways. And all of those things can have some sort of intermediate expression. Um, now, not every physical mix, like you can't throw darts at my chart and say anything you hit is possible. <laughs> not every possible kind of mixing and matching is possible. But there are really very, very many uh, different combinations that can occur, and that can occur in response to a number of different genetic conditions or hormonal conditions. So when I talk about intersex, I'm really talking about maybe 30 different medical conditions or more. Um, and a good number of intersex conditions are not ever diagnosed. So something like half of intersex people never receive a medical diagnosis. We do also, as I mentioned, see a number of different chromosome patterns. So not everybody's XX or XY. These are a few of the various other chromosome patterns that are possible, and they'll result in a number of different physical kinds of expressions. Um, and most people assume that they know what their chromosomes by, are, by the way, uh, but most of us haven't been tested. Um, and so sometimes when I talk about an intersex condition, it's not always visible from the outside. Sometimes a child is born that looks typically male or typically female, but as they develop, an intersex condition will become apparent, or they may have internal organs that don't look like what you would expect from their external body. Um, and none of us knows what our chromosomes are. There are people walking around who have divergent chromosome patterns that don't even know. Um, so if you haven't been tested, you don't know. Um, <coughs> To give you a little bit more of a, gris, a grip on this, I've put up some of the more common kinds of intersex conditions that you might see. Uh, for example, a person could be born with XY chromosomes, but have external genitals that look like completely typical female genitals. Um, a person with that condition, which is called androgen insensitivity, won't have a uterus, um, and they'll have testes inside their body where, where most female people would have ovaries. Um, so that's called androgen insensitivity syndrome. And in many cases, a person with that condition can go to puberty or older without ever being identified. Um, and then sometimes, sometimes those conditions are identified, and then that can result in problems. 
Um, you can also have a person with XX chromosomes, but who has a uterus and ovaries, and genitals that can vary anywhere from looking like female genitals with maybe a slightly enlarged clitoris to looking like typical male genitals or really anything in between. Um, that condition is called a congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, another possibility, this is a little more rare, but it's something that can happen, it's called ovotesticular DSD. Um, a person can be born with one ovary and one testis or two ovotestes that have both kinds of tissue. Um, often someone born in that situation will have a uterus. There's a number of different chromosome patterns that are possible, um, and often a person with this condition will have what's called ambiguous external genitals, which means it's what I was talking about before. The, the doctors look at the baby when they're born, and this is what most people think about when they think about intersex. They look at the baby when they're born and they say, I don't know if that's a big penis or a really, I mean, a really small penis or a really big clitoris. I don't know if I should call that opening a vagina and I don't know whether this baby's a boy or a girl. Um, so there's a, there's a number of these different conditions that can pop up. Um, the take home points from this part of my talk in terms of how do you apply this in the, in the immigration as, asylum context. Um, first of all, that there is no single marker or test of sex, either medically or legally. So often what I hear is, well, can't you just do a chromosome test? Um, no, you can't. And, I mean, you can, but it won't give you the answer. Um, and there are, when doctors make gender assignments for children that are born intersex, according to the sort of the most um, extensive, latest consensus on how they do gender assignments, um, they'll look at the chromosome pattern, but they try to make the gender assignment on the basis of a prediction about the child's gender identity development. Um, and so you'll have a lot of disagreement and often a lot of uncertainty even now about what gender a child should be assigned. Um, so the medical world doesn't doesn't agree that there's sort of one specific physical marker of sex and that's the thing you can come down to. Um, similarly, there's no real legal definition in most contexts for sex. Uh, in American law, at least, I don't know of anywhere where there's a good legal definition of sex. And um, you know, mostly it's one of those things we assume we know what we're talking about, right? We assume we know what it is when we see it. Um, and that's because we assume that what we heard in sex ed was right. Um, so the last take home point then of that little section is, uh, is something I say all the time to my audiences, which is don't believe everything you think. And especially when you're dealing with an intersex case, don't, don't believe everything you think because um, so often what we have all been taught to think just isn't true. Um, that, that nature is more diverse and more wonderful and more various than any of us have been taught to expect. Um, and from that, I'm going to move on into a few stories of some of the cases I've seen to make it a little more concrete. Yeah? Um, maybe there's a lot of unknowns about quantities because of you know, what you say. Mm -hmm. Is there any estimate at what percentage of the population may be intersex? That is a great question. Um, and there's no really good estimate. Uh, the most common estimate is about 1 in 2,000 live births. Um, it varies a lot depending on how you define intersex, which of these various conditions you consider to be intersex, how ambiguous you think genitals have to be before you call them ambiguous. <coughs> 2,000 is not a bad number. Um, and I think we can fairly assume that intersex people are going to be overrepresented in any population that's persecuted. Um, that's what we've seen everywhere we've looked for it. There hasn't been a lot of study done on this, but um, anywhere you look at um, situations where people are having a hard time, you're going to find the intersex population overly represented. Um, I also actually, you reminded me, I wanted to make a quick point about gender as well. In the LGBT context, people often think about intersex as a flavor of transgender, or they think about intersex as an issue of gender. Um, it's not necessarily that. Intersex is about a set of physical medical conditions, and intersex people have a variety of different gender expressions. Um, and so that's really important to understand. For some intersex people, the gender they were assigned at birth fits. A lot of intersex people have very normative identities as male or female, and don't experience any themselves as gay, as queer, as part of the queer community, as transgender in any way. Um, and yet they may face persecution because they have bodies that are not typical. Um, some intersex people do experience their gender assignment as wrong, and they may or may not, depending on where they're from and what kind of medical intervention they've had, they may or may not understand that as an intersex condition. So some intersex people may be telling a story that is a transgender story. 
Um, some intersex people have a gender identity that's more intermediate or they're, they're living a more mixed gender role. It can really, really vary. Um, but it's not right to assume that there's a question of gender or that there's a struggle with gender identity or something like that. That is very often not the case. Okay, so to jump into some stories and make it a little more concrete. Actually, my first story is about somebody who had a pretty normative gender identity and a pretty normative experience in his gender growing up. Um, this person was called, I call him Ben. That's not his real name, but I call him Ben. Uh, he's Southeast Asian. And this is actually not an asylum story, but because um, sex designation and documents so often becomes an issue for intersex people, it was, I thought it was an important one to bring in. He was, uh, ben was already legally in the country when I met him. He was applying for citizenship. Um, he was born with ambiguous genitals. I don't know his medical diagnosis. I don't know if he ever had one. Um, and his birth certificate labeled him as female. What that means is that in the Southeast Asian country where he was born, whoever attended his birth, and I don't know who that was or where that was, took a look at his body and decided female. And sometime shortly after that, his parents or perhaps some doctors, someone decided that no, actually he should be raised as male. And he was raised as male all his life. Um, he, all, he lived unproblematically as male. He had no problem with that gender designation. Everybody accepted him for that. Nobody looked at his birth certificate for a very long time until he came to this country and was trying to immigrate. And then, I don't know if he even knew, uh, but then he had this F on his birth certificate and it didn't fit with his whole life story and it didn't fit with his lived experience and his lived identity. Um, and when he tried to get the, the change on the documentation, what we heard back from immigration was they wanted a test to prove that he was male. And the, this particular immigration officer settled on that he had to have a chromosome test. Um, so it said, we'll change your, your sex designation if you bring us a chromosome test and show us that you have a Y chromosome. Um, so he didn't want to do that. He thought that was invasive, and I thought it was too, and inappropriate. Um, it's quite possible that he did not have a Y chromosome, and so the test would have helped him and might have made things worse. Um, and so our argument with immigration was, first of all, um, that they were trying to use a framework that was built for transsexual people and that intersexuality is not transsexuality, and that that's not what they were dealing with here in this case. Um, and I often bring that point up because it can help people understand what I'm talking about. Um, and because there are a lot of roadblocks set up for the transgender community, and that's not fair, but sometimes our intersex clients can bypass those roadblocks. Um, I also pointed out that the chromosome pattern is not considered medically definitive in these cases. That a doctor, even if this person had XX chromosomes, a doctor might say they're still a man and might have said at the beginning that he should have been assigned as a boy. Um, the standard medical practice is to assign the sex based on the predicted psychological outcome and to correct the sex designation if there's an error. And that is indeed the international consensus standard now for gender assignment in intersex cases. Um, I also pointed out that there was no federal law or regulation I was aware of that defined sex in terms of chromosomes. So often people go to that chromosome test. This is one of those people believe what they think. People think, well, I know what sex really is. It's really chromosomes. And so if we have to prove something, we can go to the chromosome test. But that's not in the law anywhere that I can find. Um, except that one case in Texas, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna last. And, and that case specifically excluded intersex people. Um, and so we said, you know, there is no real law on this. Medicine doesn't look at chromosomes definitively, um, and that the legal approach should remain consistent with the standard medical protocol. Um, and we were then able to get his, uh, his gender designation changed in his documents, so now he has a consistent identity that he can present. Um, so the take home points from that story are, uh, first of all, that it can be helpful to distinguish physical intersex conditions from transsexuality. Um, in some cases, it may be helpful to note physical features that are congruent with the person's gender identity. So if I had known that this person had Y chromosomes, I might have brought that up in my letter to immigration. I might have, but I wouldn't, what I would not have done is I would not have said, he has a Y chromosome, therefore he is a man. I would have said, he has a Y chromosome and he is a man, and you should correct his documents to reflect that. Um, and the reason for that is, um, you want to avoid creating precedent which looks to any particular physical marker of sex as being definitive. Because while it might help your client in that case, um, it might hurt the next client who comes along who has a very similar story, but one feature is different. Um, so what we're trying to do is to get the law to match up with where medicine is right now, which is at least on paper, 
medicine is saying that the gender identity is the paramount marker. Okay, my next story. Um, this is an asylum story. I'm, I'm calling this person Amadou. Uh, Amadou was an asylum applicant from a West African country who had come into Florida. Um, and this is how he told his story. He said that he was born with ambiguous genitals and raised as a boy. Um, and at, pu at puberty, it was discovered that he had a hernia and he underwent hernia repair surgery. And when they opened him up to do the hernia repair, they discovered that he had uterine structures inside his body. So it was already known that he had ambiguous genitals and he was living for better or for worse in some way, and this often happens in his culture. He was getting by with that um, and living as a boy and being more or less accepted in that role. I don't really know what his life was like before the surgery. Um, when the doctors opened him up and found these uterine structures, they decided that he was really a girl. Um, and this is in line with some older practices of medicine that are considered out of date in this country, although I can't say they're never happening. Um, but in other countries, you know, it's really catch as catch can, what a doctor's gonna know about these conditions. So uh, they decided he was really a girl, and at that point they decided he should be a woman. They removed his testes and they performed genital surgery to feminize him, to make him look female without his consent. So this poor kid, um, who was getting by with whatever challenges he had, you know, he went in for surgery for a hernia and he woke up and he was told he was a woman and his body had been changed and that he had to live that way for the rest of his life. Um, so obviously, then also, his entire community was therefore aware, now aware of his intersex condition um, and responded with extreme persecution, violence, death threats. We do see all the kinds of persecution that are, uh, that are addressed toward the LGBT community also being addressed toward the intersex community. It's assumed that, that they're gender variant in some way. Um, and so he left and made his way to Florida through you know, a variety of passages, and I'm sure you all have heard these kinds of stories before. Um, and when he, got, when he started this asylum process, he got a medical exam from a general practitioner at a community clinic in Florida who was helping this immigration project that he was working with. Um, and she didn't believe his story. She looked at him, she saw what looked to her like typical female genitals. She didn't find scars consistent with feminizing genital surgery. Um, and she thought he was transgender, that he wished he was a man, and that he was lying. Um, so that's bad, as you know. Uh, credibility is a big issue here. Um, <coughs> And there were some stories of his, there were some details of his story that seemed very improbable. Um, he said he had testes and a uterine structure. That is very, very uncommon. Even a doctor familiar with intersex conditions might think that's not possible. Um, it is the kind of story someone might make up. Um, there were also some details of his story that were very suggestive of truth, like this being discovered during a hernia repair. Um, that is actually a very common way that intersex conditions are discovered. And it's the sort, to, to my mind, it's the sort of detail that someone's not likely to make up. It's not a very romantic detail. Um, it's not something somebody would know. So, um, you know, he had this mixed kind of story. Um, and it's important to understand a couple things in hearing these stories. One is, only a small number of medical specialists are really knowledgeable about these conditions. Um, a general practitioner may be willing to make pronouncements, as that one was, but those pronouncements may be inaccurate. Um, and I know, you know, a lot of times in the field, you're going to have to deal with whatever medical help you have. But it's important to know that really they're, they're um, really Another thing that's important is to know is that it has long been standard practice and remains so in this country and other places to lie to innocent <coughs> people and their families about their conditions, about some of the physical details of their conditions. And um, whatever story is told to the person and to their parents, it's going to get filtered also through their own knowledge, through their own confusion or understanding. Um, it may be that the doctors tell something not quite true to the parents who don't understand and retranslate that and tell it to the person as they grow or tell some version of it to the person as they grow, and then they're going to put that into their own context. Um, and so, you know, this stuff is confusing and it's hard and it's tricky. As I said, even most doctors don't understand it. So if an asylee is even aware that she has an intersex condition, it's highly likely that her story is going to be filtered through many layers of lies, misstatements, and confusion that are not it, not her lies, right? Um, she may be telling the story that she knows, or she may be telling the story that he knows, and it may not be a story that is possible or true. 
Um, so what we did in that case, we got uh, this client to an endocrinologist who specializes in intersex conditions, and the endocrinologist confirmed that he was intersex and he had undergone the feminizing genital surgery, um, in spite of the fact that the general practitioner couldn't see those signs. Um, and we were able to get the asylum claim approved. Um, so the take home points from that case are, first of all, there are people who will say they have an intersex condition when they do not. Um, there are a lot of people who feel like their gender identity, there would be an explanation for their gender identity if there was a physical explanation, and they really feel like it must be true. Um, so that does happen. Uh, some people also who really do have an intersex condition will have stories that are inaccurate or improbable due to lies and confusion that they were told. Um, and consultation with an experienced specialist is probably necessary to tell the difference. Um, okay, last story. Did I just get my five minute warning? Okay, be fast. My last story, um, I'm calling this pair Kadiatu and Malik. Um, Kadiatu is a West African woman who had a child that she named Malik, with, who was born with an intersex condition while in the U.S. on a work permit. She was on a work permit. Um, when she returned to her home country, she hid the child's atypical genitals from everyone in her family for over a year. Um, finally, a family member discovered <coughs> that the child had ambiguous genitals, and her family turned against her. She was accused of witchcraft, um, and her life and the life of her child were in danger, so she fled back to the U.S. and applied for asylum. Um, and this was a tricky case because the child was already a U.S. citizen. He was born here. Um, and so, uh, as most of you probably know, there's no derivative asylum for a parent. Um, however, we were able to, um, to get asylum for this woman. It was a tricky case. We were really lucky that a big firm in New York, White and Case, took it on, and they were able to pour a lot of resources into it. Um, and they did a great job of getting experts to testify about that part of the country and how children with birth anomalies and their mothers are sometimes treated in that part of the world. And it is very common to accuse a woman who has a child with a birth anomaly in her country of witchcraft um, and therefore to attack her as a witch. It's also perceived as a stigma on the whole family. The entire family may become unmarriageable if word gets out that there was one child like this born in the family. Um, so we were able to get through, because we had a lot of resources, we were able to get the folks we need to tell the story about how things are in the the world. Although we didn't have specific information on the country conditions in her country. Um, so one of the take home points from that story is, you may have to cast a wider net. There is almost never specific information on country conditions, on intersex in that country. Um, so what we looked at was, we didn't just look at intersex, we looked at birth anomalies. We looked at people who are perceived to be gender variant. And we looked at the whole region rather than just looking at that one individual country. And we were able to gather enough to, to convince the judge of this story. Um, another point, a derivative claim may not be possible for a parent, um, but the parent herself, especially a mother, may, be in date, may have a well-founded fear of persecution as a result of having given birth to an intersex child. Um, that's the last thing I want to about that. Um, I want to close. And two minutes? Okay. I'm going to close with a quick pitch uh, that my organization, AIC, does accept legal interns. So <laughs> if there are young people here who are looking for your next internship, uh, feel free to contact me. I have some flyers. Um, and also just to let you know that we really do need your support to do this work. Um, so I, I passed out some newsletters with your information. If you got a hold of one of those, it tells a little more of Cariado's story um, and also information about how to get in touch with AIC if you're interested.